Good afternoon, everyone. Let's settle down. We'll be starting in a few minutes. It's nice to see old and familiar faces as well as new faces and making new connections. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carl Handok. I'm a faculty member here at the UP School of Economics as well as the department chairman. And it is my pleasure to moderate this event. So before we formally start, may I invite everyone to rise for the Philippine National Anthem. Thank you, everyone. You may, take the, you may take your seats. I know we're very excited, but to formally kick off this event, may I call on Dean Joy Abrenica, Dean of the UP School of Economics, to give her opening remarks. Good afternoon. Today, we formally launch the first Philippine Socioeconomic Panel Survey. We also mark the beginning of at least two decades of collaboration between the Innovations for Poverty Action Philippines, the Global Poverty Research Lab at Northwestern University, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, and the University of the Philippines School of Economics. In the age of social media and data mining, Panel surveys may seem out of fashion. Few would invest time and resources collecting data simply because the tag price is much higher and the process more complicated than alternative approaches. But no data set could be more reliable and insightful than one that is produced out of painstaking tracking of a cohort of households over a long period of time. If we truly want to understand the factors and circumstances associated with poverty and inequality, we need to invest in this costly and complex exercise. We thank our American partner institutions, IPA and Global Poverty Research Lab, for taking keen interest in the Philippines and in making a long-term commitment to this undertaking. We, your local partners, PIDS and UP School of Economics, commit to remain with you in the long haul to achieve the noble goals of this project. We hope that this afternoon's discussion could inspire many students of development to produce knowledge out of the data that will be produced from the surveys, and our policy makers to underpin future policies using the information that will be generated from this exercise. Let us all work together in finding an elusive solution to the long-standing problem that besets the country, that is poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dina Brenica, our very hardworking dean, for her opening remarks. 
And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aftad Opel. So Aftad is currently the country director of IPA Philippines and Bangladesh. He has nearly three decades of experience in the development sector, working on the implementation and evaluation of programs in the areas of social and economic development across Asia. Prior to joining the IPA, he was first country director of Vision Spring, Bangladesh, head of programs at WaterAid, Bangladesh, and WASH sector lead for SNV in Laos. He also developed an alternative livelihood programs for the Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development in Afghanistan. Aftab also brings a deep background as a social scientist. He has authored several book chapters and published numerous research articles in different peer-reviewed journals on topics ranging from poverty in Bangladesh and Laos to cross-border migration in Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Uh, Dr. Opel will tell us more about IPA Philippines, and if you're ready, after uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Good afternoon. It's really very difficult to introduce an organization when the founder of the organization is sitting in front. So, um, Innovation for Poverty Action uh, is a global research and policy nonprofit founded 20 years ago, committed to reducing poverty uh, with evidence. That's the uh, strongest tool, the evidence to reduce the poverty. With a network of partners and researchers, we design and test innovative solutions, support our partners to generate and use data and evidence, and help bring uh, proven approaches to scale. So we do three things now, research, policy, and right fit evidence. I go a bit more detail about it. Through research arm, we create stronger evidence by designing and conducting impact evaluation to measure effectiveness of programs and policies aimed at helping the poor. To achieve this purpose, we use the most rigorous methodologies while IPA specializes in randomized control trial, in recent years we have broadened our work and expanded into a larger toolkit of quantitative and qualitative research approaches to generate more evidence. IPA's policy strategy is to ensure that high quality evidence does not stay on the shelf, but instead gets into the hands of those who need it, when they need it, as we support decision makers to create better programs. And lastly, through our RFE, uh, Right Feed Evidence Unit, we support our partners on how to use data and evidence better to learn, adapt, and increase their program effectiveness. Since our founding, we have learned that generating evidence uh, is not enough, and sharing evidence with implementers does not go far enough. So to enable sustainable use of um, evidence at a scale, we championed an approach which we call uh, co-creation of evidence. The way we do it, together with our partners, we identify the most um, pressing issues that need to be addressed. We share evidence on what works. We then help identify advance and support promising evidence-based programs to reach impact on a larger scale. Throughout the process, we also build partners' capacity to use evidence for decision making. And we encourage co-creation of research opportunities that are win-win, uh, win for situation for the researchers, for the policy, and for the, for the donors, those who support our program or work. So a typical case for co-creation is one that answers questions that are important to all these parties and creates a public good that others can leverage for greater impact. So we, we, we work with academics, uh, we work with uh, funders, and we work with government and service providers um, to get a study going, especially a big study evaluating an impact program. We need all these players coming together. 
And some example of our partners in this very room are Sadeen Carlin, and then Chris Audrey, Alan Bernardo, Dr. Bevis, and Michael Abrigo from Peers and UP School of um, Economics alumni who have been in this uh, room. In terms of service providers or development partners, we're working uh, with international care ministries on various studies. We are also hoping that upcoming um, PSPS, Lively or SPAR, will be joining by them. We work with ASA Philippines on housing microfinance for uh, climate change. Um, Teach for the Philippines, we are potentially partnering with them on uh, PSPS higher education study. We work with Land Bank, we completed a survey with newly banked beneficiaries to inform Land Bank's future efforts to deepen financial inclusion impact. And our work is supported by a number of donors. DFAT um, is supporting our Supreme Court work, ADB um, supporting our graduation pilot in the Philippines, among other studies. World Bank is supporting our four-piece impact evaluation surveys, and there are a number of other studies. UNDP also supporting us, our evaluation for the Philippine plan for action for, for nutrition. In terms of government partners, we are also working with PEADS, uh, Philippine Institute of Development Studies. We just signed an MOU last month. We also work with uh, Department of Social Welfare Development, Department of Education, Department of Labor and Employment, National Economy and Development Authority, NEDA. We are very proud that we are working with so many development organizations and government partners. Our long-term presence is in, in 20 countries. You can see we are everywhere in Africa, uh, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Um, we also work in over 30 countries on project basis. We don't have offices there, but we have projects we implement there. And this has been enabled us to build long-term relationship uh, with key decision makers with those countries um, and answering their question that what work and what doesn't with evidence. Uh, we build a strong um, policy partnership. Next one. Yeah, in Philippines we started. Yeah, in Philippines we started in 2023. 20, 20, one of the two countries uh, we first started, Peru and the Philippines, uh, 20 years ago, and we have done over 70 research so far, covering 80 percent of the um, of the provinces of Philippines. Main areas of focus are education, uh, financial inclusion, governance, uh, social protection. And we are expanding, I'll, I'll coming there in a bit. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, we build a um, um, strong uh, policy partnership. Uh, you can see the picture on the left is DEPED. Uh, we have been working with Philippines. Um, we have a long five-year um, MOU with DEPED and data sharing agreement. and. That is one of the recognition that IPAs is partner in evidence generation and capacity building. Recently, together with DEPED and one of the uh, NGOs, Youth Impact, we successfully piloted a program called M Education, a mobile phone based learning intervention that provides simple and targeted math instruction to get three and four learners. We found significant learning gains, um, a very low cost. Um, 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 programs and this paper just came out last week. You can find it um, in the web. We are also planning to continue our work with DPED um, uh, to scale up this evidence-based program to reach more learners uh, in more areas to contribute to more resilient um, education systems. Um, uh, we are also um, helping DPED in their m &E capacity. And then all this work soon um, lead to an embedded um, evidence lab towards institutionalizing the generation um, and use of evidence in decision making. Uh, with Supreme Court in 2017, um, IPA partnered with the Supreme Court to conduct three evaluations of three ju judicial reforms that aim to reduce court congestion through improvements in technology and case management. So after completing the, these three landmark studies, IPA is collaborating again 
with the court to strengthen the capacity to be more data driven in, in monitoring uh, court efficiency. Together we are also establishing um, a Supreme Court uh, data hub to strengthen their capacity in leveraging data to inform judicial um, service reform. Um, with, uh, we also ensure social protection um, is, is one of our targeted areas to work. So we work with um, Department of Social Welfare and Development. We evaluated a number of their uh, program um, whereby um, the assistance is going effectively to the, uh, to the users. So G2P is one of our um, uh, prime intervention there. We also work with uh, Department of Labor and Employment. Um, we, we evaluated a program um, whereby we, we evaluated the employability um, of the students and see that, um, seen that um, a very uh, impactful program uh, they are offering. So we are also collaborating with all these ministries. We, we implemented some program. We also um, influenced their policies. We are also collaborating more and exploring um, a more to see how we can do more um, evaluation um, that uh, led to uh, improve programs ultimately to, to alleviate um, or to impact the poverty. Um, and finally, um, we are expanding in, in two ways. So PSPS, um, Philippine Socioeconomic Policy uh, Panel Survey is one of them. We want to generate more data to better understand the long-term processes of social and economic development. The Philippine Social Economic Panel Survey will be able to do that by tracking a representative sample of rural household in Western Visayas for 20 years. Later, we'll hear more about um, uh, these studies, how this data can be leveraged for, um, uh, to inform policy and programs. In terms of geographical um, expansion, we are also excited to share that we have started expanding our research and policy outreach activities in the Pacific, primarily in the Papua New Guinea and Fiji, working with partners, donors, and researchers to generate needed um, evidence while also building capacity to use the evidence to inform policy. Uh, particularly in PNG, we are building new partnership in various sectors such as financial inclusion, migration, nutrition, and providing impact evaluation capacity building services. In Fiji, we are also evaluating the secured uh, transaction reform in partnership with um, ADB's Pacific Private Sector Development Initiative and Fiji Board of Statistics. Um, in terms of um, our sectoral expansion, uh, we are expanding our sector portfolio to include climate change research, uh, a very important topic in the Philippines. So we have an ongoing collaboration with ASA Philippines and Habitat for Humanity uh, to investigate the impact of housing microloan on climate resilience. This is an ongoing study. We are also building project to reduce um, rice to burning and greenhouse gas emissions through uh, technological solution. We are also developing a project to evaluate the impact of timing of delivering emergency cash transfer, comparing anticipatory and reactionary approaches on household climate um, resilient um, outcomes. Finally, we plan to explore more research opportunities, opportunities in the intersection of agriculture, social protection, financial inclusion, livelihoods, uh, to generate more needed evidence in climate change mitigation and adaptation. So that's all um, to introduce IPA uh, to you. We can chat more during the breaks. And thank you very much for for your patient hearing. Thank you, AFTA, for introducing IP and the work you have been doing for the past 20 years. We're looking forward to the next 20 with you. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce an intellectual heavyweight, uh, Dr. Dean Carlin. Dr. Carlin is a professor of economics and finance at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management co-director of the Global Poverty Research Lab, and the founder of Innovations for Poverty Action, and USAID's current chief economist. 
His research focuses on microeconomic issues of poverty, typically employing experimental methodologies and behavioral economic insights to examine what works, what does not, and, why to, and how to address these social problems. His work spans many geographies and topics, including sustainable income generation for those in poverty, credit and savings markets for low-income households, agriculture for smallholder farmers, and small to medium enterprises and smoking cessation. Wow, that's a very big uh, research area. And also charitable giving. Okay, he has worked in over 20 countries around the world, including both low-income countries and also the United States. So Professor Carlin will be talking about why we're here today, the Philippine Socioeconomic Panel Survey. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is really a, a huge thrill for us to be launching this and launching this with such a great team of partners uh, because that's really the, the absolute key to success is, is the partnerships that we've been forming. And, and I, I also just want to thank Tara in particular for all the work you've been doing to form those partnerships, find um, and, and put this room together and invite everybody here. So. Um, and, you know, more broadly to the IPA team, too. But I know Tara has been the, the ringleader here, so thank you, Tara. Um, so I'm going to just introduce some basic, you know, kind of what are the, what are the high-level goals of this, of this work that we're doing. And in, in, a, in, a, in one way that may sound a little bit dorky, one of the goals that we have is a bit of blurring of the lines between research and action. Research and and changing, changing policy, improving, improving the lives of the poor. And the blurring of the line between research and that action is actually a really important part of what IPA is about. Uh, we want to generate knowledge. We want to generate knowledge that helps move the needle on actual policy. And the way to do that is not by having the two operate in silos, separated from each other, doing their own thing. They need to work together. And that's, that's the heart of what this panel survey is also trying to do. So, what is, you know, we use the term poverty very loosely, and I think one of the important things in the thinking about the panel and the data that come in and the partnerships we're looking to form, the partnerships with academics from different areas and different interests, the partnerships with doers, with implementers, government, nonprofit, is recognizing all of the interplay between different facets of life. And what do we mean by poverty? When we say something very simple and high, high and floating of, oh, we're trying to alleviate poverty. What do we mean by poverty? And we don't mean simply how much money do you make. That's, a, oh, that's an overly simplistic and incomplete definition. And that's important to the heart and the spirit of what the panel survey is about, is recognizing all of the interplay between these different areas. So we think about poverty as lack of freedom. And when we think about what that means, yes, that's money. Free, money gives you freedom. But what is it giving you freedom for? Freedom to be healthy, to be educated, freedom to eat, to invest, and freedom to aspire, have hope, have peace of mind, have safety. And that's basically, and yes, money helps a lot of those things, but you do need other things too, right? Other facets of um, policy. Let's keep going. I don't have a clicker. Who should I wave to? There we go, sorry, thank you, hi. <laughs> um, so, as was mentioned in the beginning, this is a, a partnership between four entities that, that ha have come together to, to see this, to launch this, this panel survey. And it's really, I keep saying panel survey, and we really shouldn't call it that. It's much bigger than the panel survey because it's all about the collaboration with, with organizations that are actively going to be do things with the policymakers uh, in, order to, in order to see that it's not just data being collected for the sake of academic work. So we have IPA, which um, we've just heard about, which has been working here for now over 20 years to do partnerships on one-off pro on, on projects, basically. There's a project on the legal sector, as you heard about. There's a project on, on distance education, as you heard about. And one of the things that's fundamentally different about what we're doing here is we're trying to put it all together into one common infrastructure so that we can study this at the same time with similar, with the data, with one data source across all of these different areas. 
Um, Northwestern University, which is where Chris will be speaking to in a moment, and I are both professors. And the Global Poverty Research Lab is the lab there that we co-lead that helps coordinate research like this and research like, I'm sorry, we coordinate this research and research like this in other parts of the world. In Ghana, in particular, is another country that we have this kind of critical mass of work together. Um, PIDS, um, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, which is a um, really critical partner for us. Thank you very much for, for being here and for joining us in this collaboration. This is exactly what I mean by blurring that line between research and, and policy, is having, having a party that is part of this process to help define what should we be asking, what, what, how, and how can we get the evidence that comes from the data into the right hands of government and policymakers so that it can help inform the design of what they're doing. And U University of Philippines School of Economics, everybody who um, is here, thank you for not just being a part of this partnership, but also actually, obviously, hosting today's event. Um, so let's keep going. And, and one thing I will say for, in terms of University of Philippines is I'm, I'm really hoping this is also helps to kickstart broader collaboration between Northwestern and University of Philippines, which I know I've had many conversations over the years, and seeing this as a conduit to find other, pa other patterns and, and ways of ha involving students and faculty in various activities. Okay, so what are some of the nuts and bolts of what we're doing? Um, the location is going to be in the rural um, Western Visayas, in, um, in the five uh, districts mentioned, the provinces uh, named there. It'll be about 16 and a half thousand households across 750 barangay. Uh, the, we also are setting it up in a way so that if we are able to raise further money, we can expand the sample to even more. Um, so we're gonna be kind of doing our sampling in a way that does allow us to add on, should we be, um, should we be lucky in that way. But one nice thing about a sample that, that's, is, that it, is that large is that it allows us to conduct randomized evaluations of programs on top of the data where there's gonna be efforts from partners that they can't go to 750 barangay. That's just not the size of their operations. It's not what they're doing. They have a program, they have funding. It can help people living in 100 barangay. That's what they can do. And so that allows us to work with them in a very fair, egalitarian way to say, great, Let's just randomly choose 100 of the barangay from the sample. Those will be the 100 that you're going to work with. And then we can use our data to compare the lives of the people living in those 100 barangay to the lives of the people in the other 650. And that's a very simplistic but high level explanation of what we mean by combining our data with implementers so that we can use our data to help understand what's working, what's not, and why of what some of our implementing partners um, may be doing. And sometimes the implementing projects could be large-scale ambitious projects, um, and sometimes they could be kind of very small-scale things that are as simple as text messaging um, information. Um, so the data, the first wave of data, oh no, sorry, go back one. The first wave of data is going to start in August 2023, and the plan is to survey every four years. And then there could be intermediate data that's not part of what the existing funding provides for, but if there's, an initial, if there's enough need for some intermediate data that's maybe collected a little bit less comprehensively via cell phone, maybe even something really simple with text messaging, with like two or three questions, then there's the idea is it's a platform from which intermediate data could be collected as well. And then, um, and then the nice, what, what's the advantage with interventions, and Chris is going to speak more about this as well, but just to, to give you a very big picture, the idea is that it's data that can be used to measure impact of interventions, but also not just in the short run, but in the long run, with, with really no additional effort by the, um, for the evaluators of that program, because the data, we're going to collect the data anyhow, so they just have to be patient. Um, so, it's not, you know, one question that gets asked a lot, uh, particularly by, by us, by people who are dorks like us, is are these data representative? What can you, s and that's important both for research purposes when you want to study a, an area and you want to know that like when you're talking about relationships in the data and whether A causes B or A is correlated with B, you kind of want to know am I dealing with a, cert, a sample that's representative. It's also obviously very important for policy. If you're the government, 
you want it, and you're hearing data about poverty levels and food security, you want to know whether, when you, so if someone says 17% of your people are food insecure, you really want to know that it's 17% of the people living in your area, not just 17% of a survey that was not representative, and then you don't know what to do with 17%. So, um, the Western Visayas is, is um, the data at the top, very crudely, you know, there's two million households, average household is 4.1, half female, 84% rural, and poverty incidence is 19%. Our sample, you'll notice, is not representative of the entire Western Visayas, okay? Um, the well, number of households is 16 and a half, average household size is slightly larger, which comes because they're poorer, um, but it is, it's close. Female, about the same, but it's 100% rural. That's a key fact, right? This is not a panel survey of the entire area. It is, we are deliberately not trying to be representative of urban areas. The reason for that is very simple, and it's not that we're lazy, but that's really hard to do, to do representative of a city. Um, you have a lot of variation, you have a lot of wealth, so how do you ever survey enough wealthy people to actually be able to include them in data analysis would be very difficult, very different survey design. Um, and, and given the importance of poverty to everything that we're doing, we deliberately excluded the, um, the urban, urban areas. And so with that, the poverty incident rate is also 77% versus 19%. And some of that is coming because the survey is going to deliberately oversample the poor households within the barangay that are, that are randomly chosen. Okay, and what's nice about doing that is it allows us to do, and everybody who uses the data, to, to have more statistical precision in answering questions about the poor, since that's what we really care about from a humanitarian perspective. But if someone wants to do representative analysis, they know that there's just a statistical weighting formula which we can help help provide and make it so that it's easy to do, that allow you to kind of rebalance the data so that you can say something that is representative of the barangay as a whole. Okay. Um, so the, the, a lot of times, one of the first questions I get uh, when we've been talking about this, both here and elsewhere, is what are you going to measure? And the answer is everything. Okay, but not quite, because there's only so much time. We're, we're, we're getting the generous contribution of people and their time with us, and we show tremendous respect and appreciation for that. And you just can't spend that much time. Okay, so, so but having said that, the, the topics are very, um, you know, widely, we have a lot of different areas that we are trying to hit at. Livelihoods, and income, environment, education, labor migration, health. So I won't list, I won't name everything, but you can see there's a wide list. So what, I think one way of thinking about it is we, we're somewhat shallow, but across a wide set of things. One thing to be clear, it is, right now is a perfect opportunity. If you are a researcher, you're a policymaker, you're a doer, and there's some questions that you think would be really valuable for something you're doing and you would like to learn or do, this is the time to tell us what you'd like to have in here. We can't promise that everybody can get what they want, we're going to work with our partners to make difficult decisions. One thing we do ask is if you make a suggestion, we'd also love to hear ideas on things that should be taken out that you think are useless or less useful, let's say. Um, but we'll make those, we'll have to collect ideas and then work with our partners to make what is inevitably some difficult decisions because time is scarce and we can only um, use up so much time of, of, a, of a respondent when we're, when we're in the field working with them. Um, so, um, as a brief timeline, we are, you know, we're really kind of cranking in here to the beginning. We, as you see on the left, we have the, the partnerships that have been formed now, and we're now starting the, starting the process for the field office setup, exploratory field work, um, getting the list of barangay and the list of households within the barangay is a key first step so that we can do the sampling. That's really important so that when someone wants to know are these data representative of the rural areas that they can feel, we can confidently say yes they are, that we did a good job of getting the full list of households and then randomly choosing within those households um, so that it's not, um, not a, so that it's a good sample in that way. Um, we're going to pilot the survey over the beginning of the summer, then we start the training towards the end of the summer. 
and we expect to start the actual um, formal data collection in around August to September. Um, probably more like September where August is the piloting. Um, and the, the surveying will take some time because you, uh, you know, one thing we learned long ago is you can't always, depending on how you're collecting surveys, sometimes it's not possible, but your data quality is usually better when you hire fewer people and survey over a long period of time. Um, but, you know, sometimes that works, but a lot of times because of seasonality, that's not possible to do. If you need to capture farming output data and you need everybody at the same time. So there's sometimes challenges, but we're trying to balance that and have, have a, um, a longer period of time of which we collect data um, with a uh, smaller set. Um, and the data will all be, obviously we have to protect individual identities and, and maintain privacy. But just so you know, the data will be publicly available once we're able to clean it and make it so that there's no individual identifying information. This is a public good we're trying to create. Uh, this is not just for us to use. We would, rel you know, even if you have nothing to do with the generation, no, submit no questions, submit nothing, the data will be out there on the internet to download and use, and anybody can do that. Um, speak for so, um, so I cl close with going back to kind of a little bit of how, I, how we started. Our overall, our slogan for IPA, actually one of the things I'm most proud of was coming up with the slogan long ago because I was really not, I was always frustrated with organizations that claim that they're going to end poverty. And I like being realistic, um, we're, you know, but I also really believe that we can make a difference by making smarter choices that use evidence and use data to figure out with the scarce resources we have, how do we do the most we can do? We can't do everything, right? That's the hardest thing about, uh, about scarcity. Like scarcity means making tough trade-offs. And the thing that I've learned over many years, but actually a lot recently with my, uh, the new work that I do at USAID, is that it's, you know, nobody sits at a table representing trade-offs. When you're, when you're trying to decide what to do, what's the most important problem to solve, right? You have, you have people that represent education and health and income and agriculture. Nobody represents trade-offs, um, except the dorky economists sometimes. But everything, you know, the dollars can only go so far, right? And you spend it on one thing, you can't spend it on another, et cetera. So you do have to make difficult choices and that's exactly where evidence comes into play, um, is to help make those better choices. And you know, it's not that with evidence we're gonna all of a sudden have 10 times more money to solve the prob world's problems. But it does mean that we can take the resources that are available and make much better choices. And it also, I like to think that there's skeptical altruists out there. I don't know if there are. I don't, I've never seen data to support what I'm about to say, but I love the idea, I love the hope that they're skeptical altruists. By that, what I mean is people who would unleash larger budgets, whether it's a government through aid, whether it's the World Bank, whether it's individual philanthropists, who are deeply passionate about helping the poor, but just scratching their heads struggling, wondering, I don't know, does this really work? And with a bit of evidence, they can be comfortable and say, okay, I was skeptical, but thanks, that's really good, clean evidence. I'm gonna, that has inspired me to go ahead and support this and unleash more money to help address the inequities in this world. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, everybody, and look forward to the rest of the day. Thanks so much, Professor Carlin. We're so excited, not just for the PSPS, but for the partnerships that will form. Paraphrasing IPA's uh, slogan, more partnerships, less burden to us researchers. Okay, good. So we have another intellectual heavyweight here. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, Professor Chris Udry. Chris is a development economist whose research focuses on rural economic activity in sub-Saharan Africa. He's also the co-director of the Global Poverty Research Lab, or GPRL. His current research interest examines technological change, risk, and financial markets gender and households, property rights, psychological well-being, and economic decision makings, and a host of other aspects of rural economic organization. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. 
a board member of the Bureau of, for Research and Economic Analysis of Development and Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Professor Udri will now talk about issues surrounding how and what we can evaluate. Professor Udri. Great, thank you. It's, it's wonderful to be here. It's my first visit to the Philippines, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Um, I want to talk about the PSPS and what we can do with it. Um, what's special about it? What's special about it is this long-term commitment. Um, we will be engaged with this for at least 20 years. Um, there's going to be regular in-person data collection um, every four years that can serve as a foundation for, for a baseline, a midline, an endline for, for various studies. Um, the second thing that's unique about it is its breadth. Dean was talking about it earlier. We're not focused on one particular set of issues. We, we want to think of this as a, in a, in a, a, a platform for finding unexpected connections between different parts of people's lives during the process of development. So we'll be, we'll be getting a picture of people's lives over a long period of time, 20 years, and a, a wide range of aspects of their behavior. OK, so let's go. And third, and perhaps most importantly, it's open. It's open, as, as Dean said. It's open in its data. The data will be made publicly available. But more importantly, the process of, of engaging with the survey is open as well. Um, we hope to engage with researchers who want to add questions, add modules. Um, we hope to engage with researchers and implementers who are interested in trying to find out whether their activities are having an impact on people's lives. Um, and so we'll be able to integrate the, the work of uh, researchers throughout the world um, and implementers who are working in our catchment area. Okay. So okay. Um, all right, so I think I've said most of this. Let me see. Okay. So one thing that we can do is we're, we're planning on surveys every four years. Um, but since we'll have a baseline survey done this year, we'll have ways of contacting through social media and through cell phone contacts uh, individuals within our sample in the intermediate periods. So that will enable us to have more flexibility to look for short-run outcomes as well as the long-run outcomes that we'll have in, uh, the, over the 20-year period. So we can think of the PSPS as a research platform in which we can provide the infrastructure on, on which people can create new studies. Okay. So you, you know all of this. Okay, so the one thing to, to mention is that the baseline data will enable you, um, if, if you have specific research interests, to identify households that have particular characteristics, demographic characteristics, economic characteristics. Um, and so we can target interventions and target other research activities on specific subsets of these households. Okay, let's go to the next. I'd like to give you some examples of what we think we can do with this um, with these kinds of collaborations. I'll start with four studies that we're planning, that we um, think are feasible, given the setup of the PSPS. So one, one collaborating researcher, Andrew Dillon, is planning to use this survey <coughs> platform to examine questions of how to collect data better. And so um, we, many social science researchers are engaged in data collection. How do we? judge uh, whether data is being collected, collected correctly, and what can we do to improve data quality. And so we can run experiments, for example, on how to train enumerators and select enumerators and who can collect uh, more accurate data at, at lowest cost. Um, so we can, we can have methodological experiments as part of the survey exercise. We can we can look at long-run questions with, the, with these data. So uh, 
one thing that we're, we're trying to organize is uh, studies of the impact of higher education. Um, how does going to college or um, affect people's welfare, and what is preventing people from going to college or not. So we're working on potentials of partnerships with um, uh, institutions that might be able to provide scholarships uh, to secondary school students thinking of going to college. What's the effect of lowering those barriers, lowering the financial barriers to, to higher education on the decision to go to college and in the long run on the outcomes of the individuals who go to college or don't go to college. So using the baseline data we collect, we can randomize households into receiving scholarships or not receiving scholarships and examine the impacts of lowering financial barriers to higher education. We can work with groups providing livelihood support um, for the very poor uh, and again, randomize access to these programs and look at the impact over, over time. We can look at um, the effects of, uh, of, of um, psychosocial interventions on people's aspirations and then on their economic behavior. So we can do some light touch interventions like providing aspirational videos to some villages and not in other villages and community meetings to discuss economic opportunities and see in the short run how that affects people's aspirations and their economic activities and in the long run their economic outcomes. Let's go to one more. Um, so those are, those are studies that we're planning, that we're, th we're thinking about, that we're, we, we think can be done in the context of, this, of the um, PSPS. Um, I, these are these are more these are more speculative ideas. I just wanted to get to give people ideas um, and, to, and to spark your thinking about how you might be able to collaborate with us and what and, and how it might affect your work and your, your research. So, one advantage of uh, our framework is that we can conduct survey experiments. Um, our baseline is coming up. We could uh, rearrange things in the questionnaires in a randomized way to see short-run impacts of small changes. So an example here would be randomizing the sequence of questions on, on how wealthy you are, your asset holdings, and questions on your psychological state or your aspirations. How does making your own current economic status salient affect your beliefs about what you can do? Um, or your, your psychological status. Another thing that we could do um, quickly is look for short-run outcomes of community-level interventions. We know where the survey is going to be taking place. Uh, for example, could community discussions of gender roles influence the allocation of resources within the household or the allocation of activities within the household? If somebody had a project like that in their head right now, we could randomize the barangay in which you held those meetings and measure outcomes at our baseline survey three months from now. Um, so that's immediate, um, some, something we could do very quickly. Another thing that we can do, um, because the um, infrastructure is there, is we could, we could look at the... Um, using the baseline data to identify a, a target, say, farmers farming certain types of crops, and um, use a light touch intervention, such as, such as uh, cell phone provided extension advice, and use either the long run outcomes four years later in our next survey, or data collection using social media or, 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 or cell phone contacts to follow up. And last is the potential of adding questions to our questionnaire. Um, the baseline questionnaire, it's rich, it's broad, but it's not comprehensive. And so there are things that are not there that, that could be there. Um, we welcome suggestions for, for new questions, new modules. Um, as Dean said, there's a limit to the, 
the length we can, we can subject people to for interviews. So we also appreciate suggestions for removals of questions as well. Um, but we'd like to engage right now with um, scholars and policymakers to modify our data collection um, activities. And that's just um, a, a broad outline of possibilities, just to try to spark your ideas. And I look forward to talking with you um, for the rest of the day and to working with you for the next two decades. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for showing us the possibilities for research that PSPS is opening up. You know, as an academic, I'm salivating about the prospects. I want to, instance, uh, for instance, look at social networks and community networks and local leaders and their influence in policies. And so, yeah, also Western Visayas, I'm also salivating for Piaya and Boracay, so that's part of it. So at this point, we're um, lucky to hear messages from Dr. Michael Kremer, Professor of Economics and Public Policy at the University of Chicago and re recipient of the 2019 Nobel Prize in Economics. Speaking after him is Mr. Eric Ocheng, uh, Research Manager at IPA Kenya. Both Professor Kremer and Mr. Ocheng will be talking about the impact of a similar effort in Kenya called the Kenya Life Panel Survey. So whenever we're ready, we can... Hi everyone, I'm very happy to be talking to you today ahead of the launch of the Philippines Socioeconomic Panel Survey. I'd like to thank the University of the Philippines for hosting and Dean, Chris, and everyone at IPA for helping to set this up. My name is Michael Kramer. I'm an economics professor at the University of Chicago and I lead the Development Innovation Lab here in Chicago. The Development Innovation Lab uses the tools of economics to develop innovations with the potential to benefit millions of people in low and middle income countries. Dean asked me to send you all a message today because I helped to set up the Kenya Life Panel Survey 25 years ago um, with Ted Miguel. Panel studies are really useful because they allow you to look at intergenerational dynamics and understand how things change over time. The initial purpose of KLPS was to evaluate the impact of early child deworming programs. Having long-run data has been incredibly useful for studies on deworming. We've been able to measure impacts on labor, out mar labor market outcomes of children who were treated 20 years later. We've in even been able to measure impacts on their children. But doing a panel survey like this also has other benefits. The KLPS data has been used to answer many other questions and produce many other papers. It's been used to evaluate a scholarship program, an educational voucher program, and non-conditional cash grants. There's a great recent paper on the general equilibrium effects of cash transfers, uh, Edgar Haushofer, Miguel, and Walker. Because of budget constraints, they weren't able to collect baseline expenditure data for some counties, so they used KLPS data. Another paper, Hex and Hex, used the data to identify a natural experiment to examine the impact of age of marriage for things like female educational attainment, health, and labor market outcomes. Many of the people surveyed didn't stay in the relatively rural areas where we started, but moved to the city. This made it possible to use KLPS data to look at the effect of urban migration on trust between different ethnic groups. Often, part of the rationale for doing an intervention is the long-run effect. We posit that interventions in childhood will reduce the likelihood that children will grow up to be poor. I think it's really important to try to measure that. So I'm really happy to see the PSPS being set up in the Philippines, and I look forward to reading about all of the insights that you'll generate. Great. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Okay, you'll take it from here? Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Um. I greet you all who are attending the launch of the Philippines Socioeconomic Panels Survey today. My name is Eric Wachin. I am a research manager from IPA Kenya. I have been working with KLPS for over seven years now. KLPS is a longitudinal study that was started way back in 1998. 
but in of IPA researchers, that's uh, Professor Michael Kramer and Professor Edward Miguel. We have had four successful uh, follow-up rounds. We finished the fourth one in January 2022. Uh, uh, currently, we are uh, undertaking the fifth follow-up round. The sample for this study is mainly drawn from participants who were participating in the DWAMI program in 1998. Uh, out of the 33,000 pupils that were dewarmed in 1998, about 10,000 of them uh, were randomly selected for multiple follow-ups. In the major follow-up rounds, our data collection efforts have been uh, focusing on health and nutrition, uh, education, labor market, that would be wages, uh, informal market participation, that would be expenditure, uh, migration as well, among other outcomes. In addition to the initial development program, we also had multiple interventions. Uh, that include the Girls Scholarship Program that was done in 2001. Uh, we also had a vocational voucher training program that took place between 2009 and 2010. And uh, we also later had uh, a startup capital for you program that took place between 2013 and 2014. Uh, let me speak more about these two main last interventions. That's the vocational voucher training program and startup, startup capital food program. So as I said before, the vocational voucher training program took place uh, between 2009 and 2010. And uh, in this intervention, we gave the participants uh, training vouchers, vouchers to be able to access vocational education. Uh, and that's with the samples of, of those uh, primary school learning program and also the GAD scholarship uh, program. Uh, the selection of these voucher recipients was randomized across all the applicants of the program, and a total of 2,163 individuals applied. In 2013 to 2014, a randomized subset of these uh, recipients of the vocational uh, uh, training program applicants were given cash cards and uh, uh, we randomly selected from that uh, pool as well and we gave them a non-conditional cash grant of about $200 and this was designed to be an extension of the vocational training program uh, in which case we will be able to uh, assess the impact of the, the two main uh, interventions, that's the vocational training uh, program and also non-conditional cash grants, uh, mainly focusing on the labor market outcomes as well as uh, life outcomes generally. From uh, round four, we, we've also added uh, the biological children uh, of these original participants into the, the study. And uh, our goal is to be able to create a panel data set of this biological uh, children of these participants with the goal of being able to examine the intergenerational effects of these interventions that I've mentioned. In round four as well, we had two other interventions that were more focused on the uh, biological children of these uh, participants, original participants. And this was including a storybook intervention uh, and also sleep intervention. For storybook intervention, initially our goal was to be able to assess the demand and uh, how, uh, if, we, if it's provided, the storybooks are provided to the participants, if that affects the involvement of the parental involvement or caregiver's involvement into the learning of the kids. Uh, then, in the way through, we also need the sleep uh, intervention in which we provided sleep uh, information treatment as well as sleep materials to the kids that were selected in the treatment groups. Additionally, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we also undertook a uh, COVID-19 focus survey module and we've been following up on some of these outcomes in the proceeding uh, follow-up rounds. We are generally happy with that the work of KLPS has shaped the discussions, uh, policy discussions with some of the evidence from KLPS work being taken up by implementing partners. And I'll give two many examples. From the evidence of KLPS uh, work, we have the Diwam World Initiative that was formed. And one of the IPA partners, that's Evidence Action, took this up. And as we speak, over 1.8 billion kids across the globe have been Diwamed. And that since 2014, when 
the initiative was formed. We have on the second example, we have evidence from the KPS work on the non-conditional cash dumps. We've seen uh, the, the programs like universal basic income program, as well as indirectly that just uses the same, implements the same model and gives non-conditional cash transfers. And uh, we are happy that this has already impacted so many uh, lives across the globe. Uh, yeah, and that's, that just shows how the extent that Kelp is what has had an impact. This is all I had to share with you all today about the KLPS work. Uh, I wish you all the very best to the PS, uh, PS team on their launch and uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Professor Kremer and Mr. Oche for showcasing how useful the uh, Kenya panel, live panel survey was. By the way, just watching Professor Kremer with that outtake is kind of like uh, watching the old Jackie Chan movies where they show all the bloopers in the end, it makes it even more special. So uh, after hearing academic talk, we now will uh, dis have a panel discussion with a special group and we will discuss the potential of the PSPS to help their own work and in their various endeavors. So the objective of this panel discussion is to bring together key stakeholders from central government, local government, private sectors, NGOs, and CSOs to discuss how panel data, especially that of the PSPS, can be used for their own programs. So we are fortunate to have with us five panelists from different backgrounds representing national government, the local government, and NGOs and CSOs. First, uh, our pan first panelist is Dr. Saralin Dawai Dukanes, Assistant Secretary of the National Economic and Development Authority, or NEDA. Dr. Dukanes is uh, uh, she, she is currently on secondment from the University of the Philippine School of Economics. And as department chair, I hope I can convince her to teach a subject, even while she's at NEDA. Uh, she graduated summa cum laude and earned her PhD in economics degree from the University of California, Riverside in 2012. Her research interests include macro theory, monetary theory, uh, and development economics. She has published on topics involving macroeconomic theory, financial development, poverty, growth, and inequality. Uh, Sarah, can you join us? Uh, uh, our second panelist is Mayor Alfredo Abelardo Albi Benitez. Chair of the Region 6 Regional Development Committee and currently the Mayor of Bacolod City. Uh, Honorable Benitez uh, is a chairperson of the League of Cities of the Philippines and chairperson of the Regional Development Council of Western Visayas. He served three terms as representative of the 3rd District of Negros Occidental and was chairperson of the Committee on Housing and Urban Development uh, in the 16th and 17th Congress. He's the lead convener and chairperson emeritus of the Visayan Bloc, a coalition of congressmen and women advancing common development goals. We welcome Honorable Mayor Albi Benitez. Our third panelist is Mar Ms. Maria Regina Pacifico, Chief Operations Officer of ASA Philippines. Um, she headed the Human Resource Department with other two departments for 12 years. Before working at ASA, she was hired as research associate at the Institute on Church and Social Issues at the Ateneo de Manila University. Ms. Pacifico earned units for Masters of Arts in Development Psychology from Miriam and took certificate courses for Industrial Relations and Human Resources Management at the Soler from the University of Philippines, Diliman. Uh, she attained her bachelor's degree in biology from Manila Central University in Caloocan City. We welcome Ms. Pacifico, Ms. Re Maria Regina Pacifico. Thank you. Our fourth panelist, uh, uh, Chief Operations Officer for Teach for the Philippines, an education NGO, is Ms. Mavi Unko. Uh, Mavi comes for, with more than a decade's experience working in journalism, research, and business development. She pioneered TFP's Teach for Philippines Data and Impact Assessment Teams and uh, works on functional literacy, numeracy, and life skills that are building blocks of the nations. Through her leadership, Teach for the Philippines continues to focus on its mission of developing foundational skills uh, in our public school students 
so that together with the DepEd, they can ensure a bright future para sa bata at para sa bayan for our children and our country. Let us all welcome Ms. Mavi Unko. Finally, we have the Director for International Care Ministries, an NGO that runs livelihood programs to help families living in poverty. She is Ms. Krisha Lim. Krisha is passionate about data and development and enjoys working with different teams to improve ICM's impact. She grew up in Manila and pursued her BA and Master's in Economics in Canada before returning to work, uh, returning to the Philippines to work uh, in areas of poverty alleviation. When she's not immersed in coding or discussions about ICM's programs, she is lifting weights or going on adventures with her husband, Kyle. So let's welcome Ms. Krisha Lim. Krisha? I hope I can lift weights too. So let me join you there. Am I using the same mic? So I welcome all of you to the UP School of Economics, and thank you for uh, coming here on, on the invitation of IPA and our partners. So we've heard about the PSPS and its potential in you know, uh, answering questions regarding development. So my, let me start with Mayor Albi. Um, for Western Visayas, Negros Occidental, I, I'm from Negros Oriental, so it's just right across. Mayor Albi, uh, an effort like this, how does this uh, improve decision making on your part or on the local government's part in Negros and maybe uh, even other LGUs in general? Well, uh, thank you. No, I feel like a thorn among roses. <laughs> I'm the We're both thorns. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the biggest problem with government is they've been shying away from intangible uh, programs or projects, right? They, they lack they don't fund planning. Mm -hmm. uh, it is because previous years, of course, they have had some bad experience of, of putting funds in something that's intangible. So they've been shying away from, uh, from uh, funding, planning, exercise, activities and uh, such as this. But we all know that the best policies or the best decisions are those backed up with data. And uh, this is something that we're looking forward to. And I think as new leaders come into the public position and, and getting involved in uh, public service are changing the landscape. And as we speak right now, we just had a regional development council meeting where we will uh, embrace uh, the CBMS, we call it community-based monitoring system, which government has launched and has incorporated in legislation, but it is not mandated, it's voluntary. So, which means only those who feel that data is important would probably embrace this program. So we, so Region 6, Western Visayas, which is probably a good uh, start for you to do this activity because you'll be able to, um, well, monitor and assess uh, what we'll be doing there. Government has the funds. They definitely have the funds to do this. And we have just discussed this in our previous meeting where we have a 36-page questionnaire done by PSA, Philippine Statistics Authority. And I've asked all the other departments, I called them in a meeting in uh, the lovely island of Boracay. And surprisingly, everybody was present. <laughs> so uh, we, we asked uh, all the department heads, the regional director, to assess the 35 pages questionnaire of PSA, if they will add more questions to it or they feel it is appropriate, it's sufficient. Because what we want to do, all the LGU will come down and do the survey themselves in all the households. So it's 100% coverage, uh, which is why I think Bacolod will be the first and uh, the prototype model for this kind of activity where we are now planning uh, launching about 500 enumerators complete with laptops and tablets to be able to uh, encode the data and the survey efficiently. So we do away with encoding, you know, from, from manual to encoding this data, sometimes you get errors. So to avoid certain errors, we will be launching um, this enumerators complete with tablets and 
and laptops to be able to encode it properly. So very useful. We, this is probably timely because you know, you'd be able to assess. I saw the slides earlier uh, by one of our earlier speakers that after f addressing the problem, finding the solution, and then evaluating the solution and, create, and co uh, collating evidences. So maybe the evaluation of the solutions of, that we have done with this uh, CBMS uh, program, you know, we will be able to convince other LGUs to embrace this uh, data gathering uh, activity. Yeah, I always believe that we need champions at the local level. So just to bastardize Dean Carlin's slogan again, more evidence, more champions, less poverty, I guess. So thank you for that. Uh, for, for Sorry, I, I had to bring it all out already because I, I have to leave in a few minutes. <laughs> so, oh, so. yeah. So I, I'm, uh, I might ask the most important question. Will it Bulaga be out of that? Okay. <laughs> Later yeah. we can discuss that. But thank you. Thank you for your intervention, Mayor. Um, from the local governments going to the national government in terms of planning, uh, we know that the PSPS is just a small part, uh, it's not even representative of Western Visayas, but it's a good start to determining, say, rural poverty. Asik Sarah, how important is this kind of effort, uh, PSPS and IPA's effort, in terms of looking at the overall picture of development planning for NEDA? Very important, uh, I would say, Carl. And you know, um, on just a personal note, I would like to say that this is like a dream come true, because uh, you know, when I came back ten years ago, I was looking for something like the panel study of income dynamics here. And yeah, as you know, we don't have that. We just have a dearth of longitudinal studies in the country. And so this is very welcome news. And uh, not from a policy perspective, even though we're just looking at Western uh, Visayas, we hope that. Uh, you know, the results that will come out of the studies that we can call from this uh, can be to some extent generalized, right? So in the Philippine Development Plan, which was uh, recently, um, well, launched, right? And with that, the Philippine Development Plan, we have the accompanying documents, the results matrix, which contains the, the targets, the indicators, uh, including the responsible agencies and such uh, per outcomes, um, outcomes that are um, identified in the Philippine Development Plan. Uh, there's also the Regional Development Plan okay, of Western Visayas. Okay, so one very, um, of course, visible indicator there, target indicator is poverty, right? But uh, so far, we've just been looking at poverty incidents because uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's easily you know, collectible, observable. Okay, but then panel studies would allow us uh, to, dig, to dig deeper, to look at the causal, causal factors uh, of, of poverty, look at dynamics of poverty, uh, you know, what causes the transitioning in and out of poverty. And uh, by gaining a better understanding of poverty dynamics, be able to just uh, uh, target our, um, our policies, uh, to better target. No, um, populations to better design our intervention programs to nuance that. Thank you so much, Sarah. And as academics, we could only just, you know, we can, we can always be excited about efforts like this. And I hope that, you know, after your stint at NEDA, we can do something about the PSP. This just about. makes me very excited to come back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, we've heard from governments, both local and uh, national governments, and for the perspective of NGOs and CSOs, uh, this kinds of effort, uh, I know you're, you, you have been working with the communities there in Western Visayas, and how will this help your respective programs, and how will this create impact in, in, in your endeavors? We'll, we'll start with Yumi Pacifico. Thank you for the question, but First, and allow me to introduce about our foundation. As a Philippines Foundation, actually, a cater to 0.1 million clients nationwide. So we have more than 11,200 employees, our manpower from Batanes until Tawi Tawi, and definitely Western designers we have there. So uh, 38 billion portfolio uh, since April 30, 2023. So that's how wide is ASA all about. 
In Western Visayas, we have 132 branches. And then we cater 165,000 clients with 285 staff. So we do the research, our own survey, but we also made it into action. For, the PS, for, the, for your uh, PSPA, PSPS, I mean, it will help us to understand at the ground levels where will be our priority will be. Number one, being with the poor is not that easy to reach. You have the data. Definitely you analyze it. But deep within that data, what is it all about? So we reach the ground levels. We do to the poor. Even with Mayor Sir Bacolon, we have so many clients there, especially during the calamity, we do there. So the data help us a lot what kind of the programs. Number one, financial inclusion. So we have micro-business. In, in, in Bacolod, we have this home improvement, home repair, because it's really the disaster. And then in Iloilo, it's more of the uh, feeding program for the children. So we have those kind of programs that will help us more uh, make it into a reality that, oh, this is the program that will fit in. Right? So we cannot deal the same program that here we have this minority, minorities to be feed, but in this municipality you cannot apply it because there is no enough children to feed. Second is the social responsibility. So we have this called a malasakit, a uh, loan without interest. So because of the disaster, so we realize that the poor need a recovery loan. So ASA is a not-for-profit, but we have to be sustainable enough to add programs for the poor. So with this program, it will make us a, a perfect avenue for us, for our team, to strategize and to put into action and to work with the LGU as well. Because the LGU has this capacity that we don't have. They have the data, but we don't have. <laughs> now we have the manpower, but they have this more, more intensive, what kind, what kind of the people that need to be targeted in to do the programs. So as working in the NGO, the data, whatever data it is, we're looking into the World Bank, we're looking into the ADB, PSA, even the LGU, per Barangay, uh, demographic profile, we actually look into talk to the Barangay company. And if we have this, especially if we have the dashboard, Hey, by month of June, this will be our program. And then by next year, this should be our monitoring. So what are this one? So again, as a Philippines is only 19 years in the in my microfinance industry, but out of 29 MFO NGOs, almost 40, 49% of it is actually a client uh, in terms of the numbers. That is HASA. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before, yeah, before before we go to Ms. Unko, Ms. Lim, I, I think I'm going to ask uh, Mayor Albi about this LGU, uh, CSO, NGO partnerships and probably uh, enlighten and how can some something like the PSPS uh, strengthen yeah. relationships between... In, in the same manner that I uh, ask all the departments, the different departments of the national government, to pull in the questionnaire so that we do a one-shot uh, survey at the household level. We can incorporate, we can even ask you to help us train our enumerators. We can even uh, say, oh, instead of spending in this area, we will spend for this, and then you can put it in uh, another area. We welcome that, and in, in, in fact, uh, we are doing that as we speak. We have started doing, uh, going down at the barangay level by July, I think, uh, after the orientation and training of our enumerators will be going down to the household level. We do welcome that. And if ever there would be some interest to collaborate with the LGU, uh, please let us know. We are more than willing to do so. Right? As, as, as you've said, data is a very crucial part of decision process for making policies, for making everyday decisions. And uh, we would like to be guided and not to be just second guessing what works and what doesn't work, right? So with that, I'm really sorry. I think yeah. uh, if you excuse me, 
Now, we, let's be, thank uh, Mayor Albi Benitez. Okay. He's a very busy person. So we thank him for his time. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you for your contributions to this panel. So yung TVJ ba? Channel 5? <laughs> so thank you, Mayor Benitez. Let's continue our discussions with the rest. So same question with your respective NGOs and CSOs. Something like this can be helpful, and in what way can it be helpful to your own programs? Uh, yeah, so I work with Teach for the Philippines. Um, we roll out, we have three core programs that we implement. Um, specifically targeting or hoping to enact transformational change in the education system. So we deploy public school teachers, we source them and we train them, uh, and we place them in, in public schools to augment manpower and human resources. That's our core program, uh, the fellowship program. We also have an extension program. After these folks are done with two years in the public school, they move on to government offices. Um, and they try to learn about policy making and how education programs are rolled out. The bet is that, you know, in three years, once they've done grassroots experience and also immerse themselves in policy work and government work, they have a more holistic view of how change is, is made within the system of education. And then we also have a third program that supports tenured public school teachers that gives them a uh, professional development opportunities that may not exist currently within the system. So for example, individualized coaching, um, social emotional support, things like that, and even inputs into their instructional skills. So those three core programs um, are what we work on and the area of Western Visayas is particularly important to us because we've been there since 2018. We've operated in 12 schools across four areas. Um, so Victoria's being one of them, Himamaylan, Kabangkalan, and Talisay, and these areas are mostly rural areas. So the parents of students that we work with are primarily farmers or, or fishermen. Um, and for an NGO like us, so we would, I think, we would, you would consider us like a mid-sized company in the Philippines. Um, we're not big by any means. It's also not part of our mission or our approach to replace the government. In fact, the way that we see ourselves is more of an innovation partner. So we look at solutions that we, we think might work um, given specific problems. We collect data on that. We try and test and replicate and roll out our own internal research. We leverage outside expertise and we provide this data to government partners. Um, it's very hard for an NGO, and I'm sure my fellow panelists will, um, this will resonate with them. It's very hard to be a project implementer while also balancing investing resources into research and data. Um, in the team, we, ha we always say like, it's like renovating a house while you're living in it, right? So you're living in the, the, in, in the living room, all of your stuff are there while the kitchen is being repaired and you're trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. And so uh, a panel study like this, where we can have access to data that's not just on education outcomes or on specific things that we can only afford to spotlight given the focus of our work, allows us to not just investigate effect sizes, but it also allows us to investigate mechanisms. So it gives us a lot of, a lot of accountability and credibility to say that, for example, our functional literacy program works. But I think it's equally valuable, if not more valuable to to be able to say what made it work and where. And so I think contextual data like this um, ex is extremely important for an NGO like us because we don't have the resources to roll out something long-term. We don't necessarily have the resources to investigate too many things at the same time, but it's especially crucial for us to understand how these things work together and what kind of environment is made out of these different factors so that we know how we can evolve our programs, make them better, and also investigate other levers of impact. So for example, during the pandemic, we realized that we had to lean more into parental capacity building. That's not something we were focused on before, but we were forced to collect data about how that would work, um, act very quickly, pivot our programs based on that, and now that opportunity exists. But whether or not we have the capacity to keep investigating that, and actually see if that, is, that, if that deserves more resources, that's not, that's not something we necessarily have the luxury 
to do, right? Because we have our programs, our funders expect certain outcomes or outputs from us. And so I cannot under, I guess, overstate the importance of, um, of data like this and of um, an initiative like this for a small NGO or nonprofit like teacher. Yeah, really especially is. now that, you know, we're recovering from the COVID and uh, there's like tremendous learning losses. So your point about uh, knowing what works and what does not and the mechanisms behind something that the PSPS can shed light on, that would be very important, not just for your own program, but for, for Sarah's uh, team at NEDA. So thank you. How about you, Krisha? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I work for International Care Ministries. We are a nonprofit organization that targets people living in or experiencing extreme poverty. So our core program is called Transform. It is a 15-week program that teaches values, health, and livelihood um, to our participants. So we operate through the local church, and it's usually the pastor who acts as a community organizer to identify these households for us. Um, and so we're very excited to continue our long-standing collaboration with IPA in this study. And ICM is actually a very, very data-driven organization. Even though we run programs, we also invest a lot, and maybe in Dean's words, too much, um, <laughs> resources into our data collection activities. Um, however, this panel is still going to be providing us a very unique data set um, because this, you know, we are following the same group of people over a long period of time and continue um, doing surveys um, with them every four years. And it's going to be collected by a high, very, you know, high quality enumerators, and this is something that we don't have, like we do our long-term programs uh, evaluation, which is like at the end of every two, two years, let's say, is the longest, not like 20 years. So it'll be very interested, um, interesting for us to see the long-run impacts of our programs and to assess the sustainability um, of our interventions. And I think maybe another, uh, with the different levels of modules and the breadth of questions that are gonna be involved, um, I'm very interested to see the different uh, maybe unintended or indirect benefits of our program to the different household members. And also, I think this uh, panel also gives a nice research platform and allows us, ICM, to network and learn from different um, partners here. And there's gonna be likely a lot of opportunities to share ideas, uh, maybe collaborate on a few projects. So we're very looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Krisha. Now, let me start. I, I saw in the slide earlier that you have a sort of a proposed study or proposed area of research. So uh, apart from that, what, what sort of other studies using the PSPS uh, would you be interested in? I mean, in your own portfolio or even, Sarah, in your development plans, national development plans. Are there any specific topics that you want the PSPS to touch on? Um, yeah, can you please share? Some? Yeah, so the study that we have um, ongoing, uh, I guess, upcoming study with on the PSPS is going to be on our livelihood program. So right now, in our livelihood program, we have like a low-cost intervention. We call it like business in a box, and we teach the participants how to make, you know, puto cheese or banana chips and teach them the skills to sell it to their community. Um, but what we're thinking of for this project is what if we give these people, like ask them or encourage them to form group businesses, so, and then we give them a grant and see what are the different um, economies of scale that they can exploit through this opportunity and maybe synergies or things that they can be um, to think about when they do group business together to hopefully boost the income, their income and consumption. Um, but I think other ideas when um, maybe Chris and Dean were talking about it with the long-term you know, studies is one of our programs is also in education, but our targets are children, uh, three to five years old children. And we also, uh, so it's called Family Academy, and we teach, our coaches teach the parents on how to teach their kids numeric and literacy skills. So these are three to five years old kids, and that's b before they go to preschool. So I think I'm like, it just sparked in my head that it'll be so interesting to see 20 years from now, where are these kids gonna be? Can we look into maybe the other education programs that will incentivize college, uh, you know, college subsidies, for example, to see are the kids entering our family academy program more likely to uh, attend college or are we able to change the aspirations that the parents have with their kids because um, of this play-based, um, improving the relationships focus of the education. Ms. Um, Unko, about education uh, in your portfolio, what sort of uh, issues or studies that you would want 
PSPS to touch on, if there are any? There's a lot. <laughs> we can be here all day. Um, no, I mean, I, I think apart, so our, one big aspect of our programming is also focused on functional literacy. I mean, if you guys have seen the latest, the last PISA results, right, um, and also World Bank data on, on learning loss, um, it really is a very urgent problem. Um, and we're seeing, just from our lived experience as an organization, you're seeing that trend um, really come alive like in public schools. So you would see, we have schools where from, I would say 50% non-readers to now 80%. Um, after like three years of school closures. So it is really quite alarming. But, but that aside, I, I guess when I was talking about like mechanisms earlier, right? Like I think one big evidence gap for us, if you will, is because of the lack of, of data available and also maybe benchmarks that we can look at is the importance of social emotional learning. Um, I think we, we lagged in, in every learning outcome metric for in the last international large-scale assessment that was taken, but we topped bullying, for instance. The incidence of bullying in public schools is quite high. Um, and what we also see in our life skills program that we roll out for both students and their parents is that very often um, home environments, I mean, poverty is a traumatic experience, right? Like living in poverty is quite traumatic. And so staying in homes where it's largely unstable or sometimes the parents don't know also how to deal and regulate their emotions or how to, to support their kids through very difficult times is something that we see more urgently, especially in the aftermath of COVID. Um, but that's something that if I'm being very honest and vulnerable as a team, we haven't quite cracked. Like we don't know where to start in terms of looking at social emotional learning in our context, just because we don't have available local data to start from. I mean, at our core, we are project implementers. And even if like ICM, we invest a lot of resources in our own internal research and leveraging external expertise, um, this is not our wheelhouse. And so something like PSPS or access to researchers who work in PSPS or in IPA um, you know, or other research organizations is extremely valuable to us. And it's something that would be tremendously welcome because we do have a lot of open questions about things outside of just um, more straightforward academic outcomes. Thank you so much, Ms. Unko. How about in the world of finance and uh, microfinance provision to rural communities? Uh, what does ASA Philippines uh, interest lie in and how can PSPS help? Are there any studies that you're interested in? Actually, all the factors you presented are all in an asset Philippines solution. But number one is really the livelihood. And then second is the health, and even the labor and migration, all the factors you mentioned. We, we're doing it, <laughs> honestly. Uh, it's just that the prioritization of which one. Uh, and then the most interesting part that approach here is the individual, as she mentioned about the psychosocial thing. Because when we go to the, to the field or to the, those poor community, or it's, uh, you know, during the time of Yolanda, so after November 8th, so 2013, so after two days, we were there, so talking to the poor, looking for them. We don't discuss about the mental health or any psychosocial, honestly. Number, number one, we discuss it more about where to get the food, where are the children, the family. And our presence, they said, is also part, already part of the psychosocial. But it's not documented. So we don't have the data. So with this one, it will help us a lot. Which are the area that, oh, this is a disaster prone area. So we have to be there. So after the disaster, what else? So what are the things, especially the mental health? It's a mental health, psychosocial is left behind, honestly. Especially for the poor. Because what they will think first is the food for their family, food for their children. Then mental health, they will not think about it. So it's a least priority. But with the data, at least, some professionals will look into that, the government also will look into that, the LGU, so they will have this ex expertise no, to, to, to give those areas. It will be really help a lot. So number one is really the documented thing that the PSP that you have is very important. That's what I, 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 I see. Thank you. Thank you. So Tara and Aubrey, the questioners will be a little bit more thicker right now, right? Okay. So Sarah, what will we work on after your NEDA stint? <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs>
But the, uh, going back to your question, so this is a wish list, right? To echo my co-panelists, there's just a lot. And we can go on and on about that. But one thing that uh, uh, at the top of my head, given the Philippine Development Plan, you know, it's a plan for deep economic and social transformation. And in order to achieve that, one cross-cutting strategy identified there is establishing a dynamic innovation ecosystem. And uh, to do that, uh, you know, we first really need to identify the barriers to innovation, innovating in the country. Because as you well know, yeah, the, the country really is not known for you know, innovating as a whole. So what are these uh, barriers? How do we go about establishing a culture of uh, innovating uh, in, in the country? Okay, so that's, uh, that's one. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. On the top of my head, I'm thinking about like innovation and technological adoption. So, for instance, for rural farmers, 20 years down the road, if they invest in like better seeds and everything, what will be the socioeconomic outcome? That's very good. Right now, my head is spinning. So, uh, yeah, so these are some of the issues that are very important that sometimes economists tend to neglect. But with the kind of data that PSPS produces, uh, this will be very important for a holistic view of development. So thank you so much to our panelists. And let me invite Chris and Dean to be part of here. We're opening up the floor to any questions from the group. Uh, if you're interested in aspects of PSPS or the work that IPA is doing, uh, I invite Chris and Dean to stand here. For those who want to ask your questions, just state your name and affiliation and um, fire away. Who wants to ask the first question? I, gu I guess I'll start. Uh, why in particular Western Visayas? Are there any, is there, a, I know there's a long panel survey in Cebu, conducted in Cebu, but why Western Visayas this time? Apart from the delicious food and beautiful beaches there. Okay. Um, anyone? Um, Yeah, Tora asked me that question earlier, and she told me I was not allowed to name the chicken in Bacalod as the answer. <laughs> um, but um, the, um, or the beaches. Um, in fairness, if it's the beaches, that doesn't really say Western Messiahs, that just says Philippines. Yeah. So, um, there was a, f a few factors. Um, one is just a recognition that we needed to be in a small, relatively small but yet large enough to have you know, you know a, a geographic area that was of that nature. Now you can say that doesn't answer your question, it just says the scope, right? It needs to be kind of a focused area in that way. But it needed to be a tight enough geographic area that we could form good partnerships with groups like, um, like ICM um, and, um, um, and you know, in the and you know, education initiatives, anything you know that that is working in a in a tighter geographic area. Because if it was too spread out, it wouldn't work to do the kind of collaborations. So that's one. The second is we we wanted an area that first of all we had experience working in, mm -hmm. and 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 that is true of the, the Western Visayas. And also we wanted, and this was key, we wanted an area where there's a good variation in, in what's happening in terms of vulnerability, particularly when it comes to climate and typhoon risk. We didn't want to work, set up the panel in an area where the entire area is prone to typhoons. Yeah. And we also wanted to make sure that, that some was, right? So that we could actually make sure that some of the important questions that do surround climate and, and risk to typhoons are, are covered within our encatchment area. So that was, that was another factor. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, thank you so much, Dean. Um, Jeff, do you have a question? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jeff uh, Dukanes. My question is, 
Uh, when Mayor Benitez was describing earlier what uh, their plans was or what pla what their plans were for a survey in their locality, I, I thought I heard they, they were planning something like the what what you what you want to do a survey of uh, all the households, all the households in their locality, and then ask them questions similar to uh, or a broad range of questions similar to what the Philippine Social Economic Panel Survey will ask. I don't know how frequently they plan to do the survey. But how will this impact the uh, Philippine Socioeconomic Panel Survey? Can I have another question also? Uh, if a member of the household or the household migrates to another area outside or even within Western Visayas, how do you plan to address this in the, in the, in the panel survey? Thank you. I'll answer the second one. You can answer the first. <laughs> um, well, Part of the design of this, the panel survey is to follow the individuals in these households. And so if there is an instance of migration, either within uh, the locality or to city, we plan to follow them. Um, and so the, that's part of the reason that we're, we're gathering so, uh, rich contact information so that we can, we can trace them over these 20 years. Um, and the answer to the first is I want to find out more because that is one of the broad goals which we haven't talked about as much here is the recognition that there's a lot of other data sources out there and some of the, some of the you know, public good that we can help create is to make it easier for researchers and policymakers to combine data sets and, 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 and um, in order to do analysis that uses both. Right? And, you know, so I, that is one thing that I want to find out more about. Um, I actually just learned about that on this, you know, this visit earlier today. And so I'm keen to understand, you know, will that, can that be linked in a way that protects people's privacy, but then does make it possible for both data sources to be combined and analyzed together. Other examples are satellite imagery data, rainfall data. These are things that won't come out of the panel survey itself, but if a researcher is, doing research, just like I explained about the vulnerability of the typhoon, like we need to know something about like where the typhoons do hit. So we will, um, we will be merging with publicly available data to make it easy so that when a researcher wants to study, um, you know, study a question that needs data from both sources, that some of that, um, some of that work is already done for them to do that, to do that linking. Um, yeah. So, so that actually is also an open question to people. If there's data you're aware of, that are public in that way or that are accessible in some way and you'd like to see it overlaid, by all means, please tell us and we will, we will work to try to make that happen and, and also make that available to others. Yeah, just a, as a related to that, we're now in the uh, fourth round, the 12th year of the Ghana Socioeconomic Panel Survey, um, which serves as partial, a partial model for this. Um, one of the most important sets of uses of that data has been linking it to other complementary data sets, um, geographical information systems and, and administrative data sets that can be coupled with it. And that yields a lot more power. There's a question here. I'm Nobel Bangsal from, from the House of Representatives. Uh, the interval for your data is every four years, uh, as seen in your... Uh, why four years? I mean, uh, FICE, the Philippine uh, uh, Family uh, Income Expenditure Household has now uh, shortened the frequency to two years. So, uh, so that's one question. Second is, of course, you were saying about inter uh, combining uh, data sets and which I, I wanted to know more in terms of interoperability of these data sets, for instance, to PSA's uh, household data. Do you see uh, both data set uh, uh, having the ability to be, uh, to have that interoperability uh, uh, arrangement uh, and also the frequency of the uh, data set, uh, which is four years can you do it much shorter? Um, so on the, on the combining of other data, usually there's, in, in a lot of situations, there's 
uh, if it's household data that someone else has, a lot of times there's gonna be privacy issues that make that very difficult. So if there's government data, like in order to actually merge at the household level, like we have to be able to know the household and that's in a lot of cases not possible just because of the privacy issues involved in for the government collecting their data. If there are other data sets out there, though, we're always happy to have that conversation and find out, is it possible with the right agreement and, and that does protect privacy. So if, there's, if the other data is more like at the, at, the, at the aggregate level, at the community as satellite, then that is data that you know, we can merge without, without having to bump into those issues. Um, so I don't know this, the exact data you're talking about, but that's basically the, gonna be delineating factor as to whether we can, um, whether, whether it can be combined. If it is government data that's household surveys that's in between our two waves, and we don't know the household, but we know the barangay, right, then you can still do some merging. You're not gonna be able to merge household to household, but you could merge at the barangay average level, and then do, and then and that could actually be, be useful. So again, if there's data like that that you think overlay geographically, um, by all means, please please talk to us about it. Talk to us about how, how you think it could be useful and we're happy to try to find out and to make the resource better. Why every four years? Because um, we don't have enough money to do it more often. Um, so, you know, one, one dream, of course, is that this gets used a lot, that everybody in this room comes up with different ideas. We form all sorts of fascinating things out of it. We can take the huge inventory of all of the stuff coming out of it and then turn to, turn to large donors who can get excited by the club good that we created that turns into a public good and, and then provide more money to do more frequent measurement. Um, but one step at a time. Thanks. Are there any questions from the floor? Um, if not, can I ask a question? So uh, to, to our partners from the NGOs and CSO sector, so based on, from your experience, I know you had partners before. I don't know if you had partners with research institutions and, and the like, but based on your experience, how can you make these kinds of collaboration work? And how can you, uh, uh, you know, leverage each of our strengths, academe, funders, your programs? From your perspective, what, what, what's there? What's a secret ingredient that could make it work? From as of Innovation Nation, uh, we have research conducted by the Habitat for Humanity. So they ask for a number of respondents and in which area. And then we are the one connect respondents from them. And they did that via phone. So that's it. So that's one of the research. And the other thing is uh, working with the water.org, they make a research, the qualitative. So which area they would like prefer to look into. So we'll provide those respondents, talk to our clients, borrowers, so that they can have easily, uh, we will accompany them and then uh, introduce to the community. That's, and that's the, one of the challenging part, uh, to allow, because there are some respondents very shy to answer. Mm -hmm. And since they know us, the foundation, there is a trust and confidence. So happy to say that out of 100%, we manage in internal survey, we managed to do the 97% our respondents because the others are not, and because we have the timeline. So it's just that a matter of we have the community, we have the stock at the ground level, and then uh, what are the respondents that you need, then we can provide. Uh, you can have it in Mindanao, Marawi, whatever, wherever, even those areas, we have those. Thank you. Yeah, so I have, um, I guess, two examples from our, from our history as an organization. So before we were Teach for the Philippines, our precursor organization was called Sa Aklat Sisikat, which literally translates to reading makes you cool. Um, so we used to just roll out literacy programs um, and in about their 10th year before, right before we turned into Teach for the Philippines, they, they did an RCT with MIT j -Pow. Uh, so they worked with Lee Linden, um, and that, first of all, you asked what it takes, fundraising, <laughs> um, and specifically fundraising for research matters. I think 
in our organization, just speaking, I guess internally, it also matters that there is buy-in across different levels of the organization. And there's a recognition that this is important and it matters and it has the power to push your agenda. So that's at like a super high level. Most re more recently in 2020, we worked with ID Insight. Um, so we had started talks with them before the pandemic hit about a more um, rigorous evaluation, not necessarily an RCT, but something that just looks at our literacy program. But halfway through the conversations, the lockdowns happened, and so we had to pivot the focus of that study. And so it turned into a process evaluation slash rapid assessment um, based on what is, like for, for all intents and purposes, became a pilot program because we changed our assumptions, we changed the way we delivered the program. Um, I would say that it took a lot of courage as an organization to lean into measurement at a time when no one knew what the heck was going on. We got external advice saying, you should just write this year off and not pay for measurement or not even invest there because like, you know, all bets are off. Um, but we decided as a team that this was important enough and that whatever we found here may not be something that we can use to market ourselves, mm -hmm. but it can definitely be used to build knowledge and make us better as an organization. So we found really encouraging results. We also found really sobering ones, like what exactly are you trying to do with this specific program? It seems like your logic links aren't clear, which is also super crucial, I think, if you're if you're a project implementer to really lay out what it is your program's trying to do and how that maps all the way to your initial inputs and what you, you're putting in, in terms of resources. Um, but overall, I think what mattered the most for us and what is super understated is the importance of culture within your organization. Because I think as a team, if the team didn't buy into the idea that measurement is important, and that it's worth investing in, we wouldn't be able to sell the idea to external stakeholders. We wouldn't be able to sell it to the government as you know something that we wanted to pitch because you need to pitch to the Department of Education if you want to start randomizing sections of children. That's not necessarily like a given in public schools. Um, you need to talk to parents about coming into their homes and talking to them about their household conditions, etc. And, and most of all, you need to get buy-in from your teachers who are going to be rolling out these assessments, and in our case, encoding the data. Um, and all of those things, all of those trappings in any particular research project um, isn't possible without you making sure that your team understands the value of what you're trying to do. And yeah, so I, I would say that, and, and I think it's also important that for, for, for anyone who's trying to do this or looking to do this to realize and manage their expectations at the onset that it is a very iterative process. Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't recommend that as an NGO that you jump into a randomized control trial on your fifth year. <laughs> um, maybe do a, a few internal research cycles first, try to see what your, what your program is in effect doing and how, or how you're really implementing and then maybe do a process eval or maybe, maybe an RCT isn't even the study that would answer the questions that matter most, right? So I think that kind of discernment is super, super important. Um, Wonderful. Uh, Krisha? Yeah, this is a very, I, we should talk after. <laughs> um, I think what we, so ICM has been doing a lot of randomized controlled trials, but it, I think it really sparked when our CEO met Dean, and I think Dean was thinking, oh, this guy will um, help fund IPA, but it ended up to be a very long, decade-long partnership now, and continuing for the next 20 years, maybe. So I think that it really shaped the culture of ICM to be very, very research, data-driven, and I think internally, perhaps we have learned to you know, improve our monitoring and evaluation systems, and at the same time, learn from different experts from different fields. And I think it has um, really improved some of our mechanisms. Think about our theory of change, like you mentioned. It's super important. I think it helps us map out. Um, sometimes, you know, as development practitioners, you have this theory of change in your head, and then when you show it to an academic partner like Dean, he's like, what is that? It looks like someone just sneezed on a, a piece of paper. Um, and so it really helps us to refine our own strategies and think about what is our program actually doing, breaking it down, what are the questions that can um, measure those. 
And I think that's something that we really benefited from it. Um, another thing is that we learned a lot from you know, how IPA does their surveys. So we do our own surveys. We hire like 100 enumerators at a given time to survey up to like um, 5,000, 6,000 households. So it's a lot. And it really took us a lot to go from paper to tablet. And I think it, it really came from IPA's leadership in helping us to move towards this direction. But it's really, you know, it's a challenge. And I think it is an iterative process. I think sometimes it'll be hard whenever maybe operational questions are not very academically interesting. And so it is having to figure out the balance of you know, coming up with a very interesting data set, be able to publish a very good paper at the same time, answer maybe some of the questions that our operations team have. And I think it will be um, maybe listening to, you know, like IPA and like other partners who say, okay, what is the study that we can design to answer those questions and then um, come up with a plan for that. Excellent. So this speaks to a very close collaboration between research institutions, academic institutions like us and partners on the ground. So it's, it's nice to hear from, from partners on the ground on their perspective on that. So I have one minute left. Uh, are there any questions from the floor? Maybe I can ask a final question if you indulge me. Um, because I've, this is running in Ghana, this is running in Kenya. So any lessons from those two countries on what would make this PSPS project particular work? I mean, given the different institu difference in institutions, do you think there are like common lessons that can, be, uh, that can be learned from those two countries that can be applied here? Um, I think the, the most important one is partnerships. Yep. That, you know, it's, you know, just going and collecting data in the long run as a researcher is, you know, if you just did self-contained and put blinders on, you could do it, but you're not going to generate the kind of insights that you get from partnerships with implementers, partnerships with government. And some of those partnerships have to be formed without really knowing where it's going to go. Without, um, you know, just with the, you know, some basic principles and ideas and some guidance, but, um, but not knowing exactly what's going to be the use case, but just mm -hmm. accepting that. So that there's a lot of learning in between from yeah. partnerships. Yeah. A very one very practical thing we learned in Ghana is don't go, don't go too spread out geographically. Focus. Okay. So it's a little bit to your question. The Ghana panel was throughout the country of Ghana, mm -hmm. and it did make it hard to find implementing exactly. partners to conduct randomized evaluations that had a footprint that was also large enough. And so that's that's one of the re that's one of the very very you know kind of granular takeaways from from Ghana. Um, the, the the Kenya one was um, was integrated more with interventions from the beginning, mm -hmm. kind of like the way we were here, although um, and so and it also was a tighter geographic area, so it was more similar to, to this one. Excellent points. If you have anything to add, Chris, but yeah. that's exactly what I would have said. And um, one thing that's, I think, true about both of the, all three of these cases is that the partnerships will be facilitated by this long-term commitment. The fact is everybody knows that everybody's going to be around for a long time. Makes it, I think, more likely that we can go through this iterative process of making partnerships work. Long-term commitments, Chris. I love that. So, um, so we thank our panel for their very good insights. So not just for the PSP, as a, but how to make projects work in such a diverse uh, environment as Ghana, Kenya, Philippines. But uh, we wish IPA all the best. In the next 20 years, we hope to see you all again here soon. So let's thank our panels, Chris, Dean, uh, Sarah, Ms. Uh, Unko, Ms. Lim, and Ms. Uh, from Assam, Miss Fred. So, uh, is there any picture taking with the panel? Uh, we call on uh, if before they. Lead.
So all good things must come to an end, and we now come to a close. Uh, to give the closing remarks, may I call on Dr. Marife Ballesteros, Vice President of one, of one of our partners, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, to read Dr. Aniceto Babes Orbeta's message. Uh, Dr. Aniceto Orbeta is um, President of the PIDS, and uh, he's a senior research fellow since 1992. His research include education, labor market, social protection, demographic economics, information and communication technologies. Dr. Orbeta served as professorial lecturer at the UP School of Economics and visiting researcher at the Asian Development Bank. He has a PhD in economics from UPSC and did his postdoctoral research at Harvard University. Dr. Ballesteros. It's unfortunate that uh, Dr. Or Orbeta cannot join us today uh, due to health reasons. So I'm here to deliver his closing remarks. But on a personal note, uh, this uh, partnership is actually a welcome development for PIDS. Uh, the strength of PIDS lies in uh, our capacity to do empirical research and link the results to policy making. And while we are considered as, or identified as the government research arm, or a think tank, as what the media would uh, love to introduce us, uh, access to data, data limitation has been uh, a challenge for, for us. So on behalf of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, we are grateful and delighted to join the Innovations for Poverty Action Philippines, the Global Poverty Research Lab of the North Northwestern University, and the UP School of Economics for today's launching of the Philippine Socioeconomic Panel Survey. The panel survey promises to provide publicly available data that can enable researchers, government actors, and non-government practitioners to better understand the long-run social and economic development processes. As such, it promises to overcome the limitations of conventional data collection efforts, which are snapshots, as the theme aptly describes. So this effort to draw, draws inspiration from the, the remarkable success stories of panel sur surveys worldwide. The Kenya Life Panel Study, which was actually presented or uh, uh, provided to us as an overview, is a, an example demonstrating how long-term data collection has led to transformative initiatives such as the, the Worm the World Initiative. In the Philippines, the collaboration of the Carolina Population Centers and the University of San Carlos implementing the Cebu Longitudinal Health Nutrition Survey also stands a remarkable testament to the power of long-term research in understanding the complexities of population health. So essentially, this is not actually the first time that we have this type of, uh, of efforts for longitudinal uh, survey. Through the CLHNS, which is the Cebu Longitudinal Health and Nutrition Survey, Researchers have made significant contributions to our global understanding of health and nutrition and have also played a pivotal role in informing public health programs and policies in the Philippines. We believe that the PSPS will pave the way for similar catalytic efforts, engaging researchers, stakeholders, and funders to tackle the issues uncovered through this provision of long long-run data. So PIDS in participating in this effort will enrich the basis of our policy-oriented studies that the Institute does to, policy, to assist policymakers and planners in crafting development policies, plans, and programs. Moreover, it aligns with other mandate of the PIDS, which is actually establishing and maintaining a repository of economic research information. So it is for these reasons and more that PIDS supports the Philippine Socioeconomic Panel Survey, making the results of the 20-year panel survey available to the public 
is a step to the right direction. This could encourage our res other researchers, not only PIDS, to pursue studies on the development sector, which could inform government response to present and emerging policy issues. So in closing, I would like to express uh, our deepest appreciation to those who have worked tirelessly to bring the Philippines economic, socioeconomic panel survey to a promising start. Let us embrace this opportunity to harness the power of long-run data, drive socioeconomic development, and help craft a brighter future for the Filipinos. Thank you, and may we have a great evening ahead of us. Thank you so much, Ma'am Peng. Thank you to Dr. Urbeto for that message. So what can I say? Mabuhay ang PSPS to the next 20 years. And in behalf of the UP School of Economics, thank you for attending this event. Let's have a little bit of refreshments at the back. Let's talk to each other, and let's deepen our partnerships. Because more partners, more fun. Right? Thank you.